Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today from the Anticoagulation Forum. Uh, Anticoagulant Treatment of Cerebral Venous Thrombosis, Where Are We in 2022? I'm Deb Siegel. I'm a hematologist in Ottawa, Canada, and I'm thrilled today to be joined by two esteemed colleagues. Uh, Dr. Thalia Field is our visiting expert. She's an associate professor in the Division of Neurology at the University of British Columbia, also in Canada where she holds a uh, Sauter Family Heart and Stroke Foundation uh, Stroke Research Chair. Uh, importantly, and particularly relevant for our discussion today, is that she's the investigator of the SECRET trial and parallel registry, which is examining treatment strategies and prognosis of cerebral vein thrombosis. And she also has uh, research interests and clinical interests in the stroke in young and marginalized groups with a focus on patient-centered outcomes and engagement of young pe of people with lived experience to enhance meaningful outcomes of clinical research. And I'm also uh, excited to be joined today by uh, Dr. Arthur Allen, who is uh, the Anticoagulation Program Manager at VA Salt Lake City Healthcare System in Utah. And uh, I hope that you will enjoy our presentation today. Uh, a few administrative details. Uh, these are our disclosures. For today, you can have a look at those. And also really important for you is, to, is how to claim credit uh, for watching our webinar. Um, the instructions are here on the screen, and we're going to put a link to uh, the website in the chat for you as well. So please go ahead and do that. And so what we hope to accomplish today are three things. We want to review the epidemiology, clinical features, and diagnosis of cerebral venous thrombosis. We want to discuss emerging data regarding the treatment of CVT with DOACs, uh, with a focus on the ACTION CVT study, a recent, uh, recently published cohort study. And finally, we want to outline clinical and research priorities regarding anticoagulation uh, for cerebral venous thrombosis. And so this is the part of the program, of course, where there's you know, questions instead of answers. And uh, it's important to look to the future and, and uh, to see where we can go next. So we wanted to set the stage today by just discussing a few cases. And these are representative cases similar to patients you may have seen in your own practice, certainly uh, similar to those who I've seen in my practice. Uh, the first case is a 32-year-old woman who's admitted to hospital uh, four weeks postpartum with uh, cerebral venous thrombosis and a small venous infarct with hemorrhage, and there's no other provoking factors identified. The second case is a 63-year-old male with extensive cerebral venous thrombosis without parenchymal injury, and in his case, um, there's no identified provoking factors that are apparent. The third case is a 51-year-old woman on hormone replacement therapy with estrogen who presents with an isolated sagittal sinus thrombosis with no venous infarct, and uh, there are no other provoking factors in her case either. And then finally, a 29-year-old woman with uh, CVT while receiving treatment with estrogen combined oral contraception, um, and she has extensive parenchymal hemorrhage and requires a hemicraniectomy. So some of the uh, features in this case, I think, you'll see are, are carried throughout the presentation. And we'll return to these cases at the end in order to discuss some of the key aspects and also maybe to stimulate some discussions uh, after the presentation. So just by way of introduction, I think it's important to start at the beginning. What is cerebral venous thrombosis or CVT? Uh, and this really refers to the complete or partial occlusion of two types of vessels the cerebral major venous sinuses, which is the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, and also includes the smaller feeding cortical veins, which is referred to as cortical vein thrombosis. And so although you will hear people say CVST referring to cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, we don't want to forget about the cortical vein thrombosis. And so the term of uh, cerebral venous thrombosis or CVT is more comprehensive. So what happens when uh, one of these vessels is occluded. Well, there's two main processes that occur. The first is increased venous pressure, which reduces capillary perfusion, uh, causes vasogenic edema in the brain, which then decreases cerebral perfusion pressure, or CPP, causing decreased cerebral blood flow, and then ultimately tissue infarction. 
And then the second process is uh, possibly reduced cerebrospinal fluid absorption. And this uh, can occur, especially when the superior sagittal sinus is uh, obstructed. And what happens is, is that the arachnoid villi, villi are blocked um, and this can lead to increased intracranial pressure with or without tissue damage. So just to say that not all CVTs uh, present with this extent of damage, but just to give you a sense of, um, of how the pathogenesis uh, develops. This slide summarizes four key points about the epidemiology. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say that this is a rare, rare condition. The incidence is 10 to 20 per million per year. It's more common than women and men uh, with a ratio of about three to one affected. And you'll also note that the um, predominant population affected are those less than 55 years of age. So 80% of um, affected individuals are less than 55 years of age. Importantly, it is rare and it represents you know, 0.5 to 1% of all stroke presentations. And there are a lot of risk factors and we've summarized some important ones on this slide. Um, uh, estrogen contraception, pregnancy and the puerperium are very important risk factors. Obesity, the presence of thrombophilia and that could either be genetic or acquired, uh, infections, malignancy, and then mechanical causes like surgery or trauma. And this slide summarizes again, many risk factors on the left-hand side of the screen. You can see that nice forest, forest plot, which shows the pooled odds ratio associated with each of those risk factors in a case control study or case control studies. Um, but I think to summarize, you can see that there are a lot of risk factors for CVT and most patients have at least one risk factor identified. So 85% of cases. And also important to know that 50% are associated with uh, estrogen containing contraception at, and or pregnancy or postpartum. But it wouldn't be 2022 if we didn't mention COVID. Um, of course, CVT has had some uh, important press because we've seen uh, CVT associated with one of the rare complications of uh, vaccination, which I'm gonna show you on the next slide. Before COVID, you know, again, a, a, at least um, with regards to epidemiology, we're looking at rates of 10 to 20 per million per year and about 0.5 to 1% of stroke, as we discussed. In the era of COVID, we're seeing um, more frequent CVT, 40 per million within two weeks of COVID infection. So there is an association be between COVID and CVT. And of course, uh, not um, with respect to VTE and COVID, uh, we know that there are increased rates of VTE seen uh, with patients, particularly those with severe infections. And so we see that uh, in the COVID era, CVT represents 5% of strokes. But it's also important to mention VIT, which is vaccine-induced immune thrombo thrombotic thrombocytopenia. And this is a, a syndrome that's associated with the adenovirus vector COVID-19 vaccines. So AstraZeneca or Covishield and Johnson & Johnson um, and this is really a syndrome that results from the development of a platelet activating antibody against platelet factor four. And so this is similar in pathogenesis to heparin induced thrombocytopenia. And this is a, a very specific type of syndrome um, related to COVID vaccination, with, again, with these adenoviral vector vaccines. Um, and that actually one of the predominant manifestations was cerebral vein thrombosis. Um, so just important to keep in mind because there are treatment implications um, as a heparin containing anticoagulants should be avoided for a bit. And we'll talk about that uh, a little later on. So there are a few clinical syndromes. So how do, how do these people present? Um, there's three kind of main clinical syndromes of CVT presentation. And this is really just meant to summarize this. Um, isolated intracranial hypertension, which includes things like headache, vomiting, visual problems, and papilledema. There is a focal syndrome, which includes things like focal neurologic deficits and seizures. And then finally, the most severe type of syndrome would be encephalopathy, where a patient has multifocal signs, mental status changes, and, and may end up developing a stupor and coma in particularly severe cases. But it is really important to, to keep ZVT, uh, a high clinical suspicion of CVT, or have a high index of suspicion in patients who have a new onset headache, particularly if the headache is severe and unrelenting uh, with different features from a patient's usual pattern. So if a person has a new headache, 
uh, that's not really going away um, with the usual treatments or they have a headache that's different from their usual pattern. And then of course, symptoms or signs of intracranial hypertension. We talked about those, you know, nausea, vomiting, um, focal neurologic deficits, um, changes in mental status, et cetera. And then of course, encephalopathy, that would be severe. And that those patients require urgent brain imaging in order to evaluate for CBT. And the tests of choice here are MR or magnetic resonance venography or CT venography. So it is not uh, sufficient to, for a patient to undergo a plain CT head, for example, without contrast, because you need contrast in order to visualize the, the clot. And so that's actually a really important feature. If a CVT is on the differential diagnosis and that is something that's being evaluated with imaging, then that needs to be specifically communicated to radiology. And if you're not sure of what test to order, of course, then you know that's where um, it will be really helpful to liaise with radiology uh, in order to determine what test would be the most helpful. And once the diagnosis is made, you know, anti-thrombotic treatment is indicated essentially as soon as possible. This is an acute venous thrombotic complication, just like for PEDVT, we want to administer uh, anticoagulant medication. So typically this is done in a, in a hospital setting uh, with low molecular heparin or perhaps uh, intravenous unfractionated heparin. I put DOAX on there just because it's something that comes up in, converse, in, uh, in our discussion. And we'll talk about the potential role for DOAX. Usually we consider this uh, kind of for post-acute treatment, but there may be scenarios where we may consider it um, earlier on, uh, less, much less common uh, in the acute setting. We're typically looking at low molecular heparin, unfractionated heparin. It's also really important to mention here that's highlighted on the right side of the screen is that uh, CBT may be complicated by hemorrhagic venous infarction. And again, that's because of the back pressure we talked about um, in the earlier pathogenesis slides, which causes increase in pressure and can cause uh, capillary damage. Um, it, so these uh, venous infarction with intracerebral hemorrhage or isolated subarachnoid hemorrhage are not contraindications to anticoagulation. And of course, this means that you should liaise with someone who has neurological expertise, you know, neuro neurology or neurosurgery, of course, but just to keep in mind that, that does not preclude a patient from receiving anticoagulation. Anticoagulation is the treatment which will relieve that pressure um, and uh, therefore uh, decrease, potentially decrease the bleeding risk. But uh, these patients need to be monitored in the right type of setting. Um, and it is helpful to have uh, neurology, neurosurgery expertise um, when making decisions, if you're not, particularly if you're not sure. But those recommendations around heparin and low molecular heparin do not apply to the situation of VIT, which we talked about. Um, uh, pathogenesis, again, is similar to HIT or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And so for those cases, you would want to use a non-heparin anticoagulant. And there's a long list of those. Um, you know, something like uh, uh, um, argatroban, bivalirudin. Sometimes we have used fondaparinux, although it has a long half-life and renally excreted. So often in the setting of CVT, particularly if there's concerns around a hemorrhage, a short-acting anticoagulant um, that's non heparoid would be appropriate, like argatroban, for example. And so we have some limited data uh, to inform our decision-making in the acute uh, antithrombotic setting. Uh, low molecular heparin is generally preferred over unfractionated heparin for lots of sorts of reasons, uh, not the least of which is that it's much more reliable uh, anticoagulation um, because it's the anticoagulant effect is much more predictable. Uh, however, there are some scenarios where you may want to consider unfractionated heparin. What do the what do the studies show us? Well, in some small studies, you can see low molecular heparin uh, was compared to unfractionated heparin on the left hand side of the screen. You see a small study of 66 patients. This was an open label trial. So that means that you know physicians and patients knew what treatment they were getting. Um, they compared low molecular heparin to unfractionated heparin. And in hospital mortality was decreased among individuals who'd received low molecular heparin. Um, and uh, complete recovery at three months uh, was higher in those receiving low molecular heparin. Again, methodological issues around open label trials. However, you know these are the data um, that are available. Uh, in the middle, you see the results of a, a summarized of a case control study, 421 patients. And so again, this is people who were managed in clinical practice. Um, they were not randomized to receive one treatment or another. And a similar proportion of patients uh, were functionally dependent at six months in the low molecular heparin and unfractionated heparin group. Um, and mortality was also similar. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, a double-blind randomized control trial, probably the best the best uh, evidence for assessing the differences between treatments or for comparing treatments. 
uh, done at a single center, uh, patients received loma liquid heparin or unfractionated heparin, and there was no difference seen in neurological deficits, disability, or death, although, again, here, small sample size really uh, makes one wonder whether or not there was sufficient statistical power to be able to detect differences uh, in those study populations. So um, some of the reasons we might prefer unfractionated heparin are concerns about the need for imminent surgery, a patient with you know, renal failure, uh, and there are some other uh, reasons that that might uh, be appropriate, and we can talk about those certainly in the discussion section. So we're going to talk now about post-acute anticoagulation, and this is where I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Field to come on, and I'm going to, she's going to share her slides. Thanks so much, Deb, and uh, thank you again to the organizers for having me uh, join you today. It's, it's a huge honor. I'm just going to put here the presenter view, and hopefully that works there. Now, do you see the, do you, do you see like the, uh, the whole presenter view or just the slides? You just see the slides? Good. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay. So um, yeah, the conversation about DOAX versus warfarin most commonly comes up after that kind of hyperacute phase when you're deciding what that long-term transition to a non-parenteral agent or oral agent is going to be. Um, our evidence in adults, uh, like- Dr. Field, I'm sorry. I just want to let you know, it's not in slide mode. You might want oh, to- Oh, it's not? Something. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Let's and do that again. And slideshow. How's that? That's better. Thank okay, you. good. Okay. So the, the evidence that we have for adults is uh, mainly from uh, two large studies. There's the randomized RESPECT CVT trial, and then the ACTION CVT study, which we're going to be speaking about. So RESPECT CVT came out a couple of years ago. This was a randomized trial in adults who had an acute diagnosis of cerebral venous thrombosis. They had what we would call mild to moderate severity of CVT in that they weren't comatose and weren't needing like imminent surgery or endovascular therapy or things like that. And um, there were also kind of no controversies over whether these were the sorts of patients that you could give DOAX to in that they weren't pregnant, they didn't have antiphospholipid anti uh, antibody syndrome or cancer or infection or things like that. 120 patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either dabigatran, 150 milligrams twice daily for 24 weeks versus uh, dose-adjusted warfarin. And uh, the primary outcomes were recurrent venous thromboembolism and safety outcomes included death and major bleeding. And then recanalization was a secondary efficacy outcome. So patients were randomized after five to 15 days of parenteral therapy as lead-in. So no one kind of started off with a DOAC right off the bat. And after that, they were randomized to either therapy and followed up until the uh, end, which was at six months. So uh, when we compare the results, and, and I would mention that the study was not powered to uh, detect its efficacy outcome um, because cerebral venous thrombosis is such a rare uh, diagnosis, even though this was a multinational study, they were aiming for kind of this uh, pilot style trial for 120 patients. What we'll notice is that the major bleeding risks between the dabigatran and the warfarin groups were similar. There was one GI hemorrhage that was major in the dabigatran group and two intracranial hemorrhages in the warfarin group. Um, when we add clinically relevant non-major bleeding to that, uh, there was just one additional event in the warfarin group. And uh, when we look at uh, both new intracranial hemorrhages, in addition to worsening of baseline intracranial hemorrhages, there was one patient in the dabigatran group that had uh, worsening of their hemorrhage. The other thing just to show is that uh, the recanalization rates were similar between the two groups. So basically, um, after respect CVT, there was published evidence that was suggesting that there were kind of no major safety signals for use of DOAX as compared to warfarin in more straightforward patients with cerebral venous thrombosis who had had a parenteral lead-in. So that led to the uh, Action CVT study, which was uh, recently published earlier this year. And Action CVT, you know, given that cerebral venous thrombosis is a fairly rare diagnosis, was quite an impressive effort. It's a retrospective study looking at the clinical experience of patients who are receiving either warfarin or DOAX or some combination of both as part of their normal treatment. 
They collected data from 845 patients across multiple countries. And again, the target population was this, quote, mild to moderate CBT group without a clear indication to not be using either DOAX or, or warfarin in a particular situation. So they compared the results from patients who were on either DOAX or warfarin after parenteral lead-in. Uh, they excluded patients that were on some combination of both in the analysis. And the outcomes they looked at included, again, venous thromboembolism, recurrent events, death, major bleeding, and uh, recanalization. So what do we see when we look at the uh, population that was recruited into this study uh, retroactively? So what we can see, first of all, is that the age is, for the most part, in keeping with what we see in other uh, observational studies uh, looking at cerebral venous thrombosis, usually the mean age is around 40, and here patients uh, were of similar ages in their mid-40s. Um, in previous observational series of CVT that are quite large, it's usually about three quarters women. Here, uh, it's a little bit less than that, about two thirds. Um, and uh, one uh, thing to note just between the two groups is that there is a little bit of an imbalance with respect to history of venous thromboembolism between the DOAC group and the warfarin group. Um, and uh, only about a quarter of the patients in the study were using oral contraceptives as their risk factor for CVT. In uh, other large observational series, this can be up to 50% as the precipitant for CVT. So the other thing just to look at is what sort of parenteral lead-in people may have had and what sort of patients were being included in terms of their severity. Um, so we'll notice that about three quarters of patients had a heparin infusion. What's interesting is that if you look at the warfarin group, those patients look like they were probably transitioned from unfractionated heparin in many cases to low molecular weight heparin, whereas we don't really see this so much in the DOAC group. There were few patients that were having interventions that we would think of that would be in keeping with more severe presentations of CVT. For example, you can see it's a minority of patients that had endovascular treatment, which is typically a heroic rescue therapy, and very few patients had neurosurgical treatment, uh, which is in keeping with what we would expect to see in general uh, CVT populations. Most patients received about six months of uh, oral anticoagulation in total, and their follow-up imaging was done around the same period of time, and the majority of patients also had at least three months of follow-up to judge outcomes. And then with respect to the DOAX that CVT patients were on, um, the majority of patients had been prescribed apixaban uh, with uh, smaller minorities on both rivaroxaban and dabigatran and very few patients on uh, adoxaban or uh, any other agents. So when we look at the outcomes, what we can see is that the uh, rates of recurrent venous thromboembolism were similar between the DOAC group and the warfarin group. What's interesting, and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get to this at the end, but the rates of recurrent venous thromboembolism had got my attention because they're actually quite high. And the reason um, that this is the case, as far as I can tell, is because they included asymptomatic extension of venous, uh, of cerebral venous thrombosis in that recurrent venous thromboembolism group. And that's not an outcome that's typically included in CVT studies, just because, you know, sometimes it can be a bit of a subjective call. And uh, if there are no clinical implications, kind of, again, uh, the, the significance of this is, is debatable. But in any case, that wouldn't bias us towards one group being more favorable than the other. Um, and again, there were no differences between groups. With respect to major bleeding, there actually was a difference between the DOAC group and the warfarin group with lower rates of bleeding in the DOAC group. And this was primarily driven, like most studies, uh, comparing DOAC and warfarin by a reduced risk of intracranial hemorrhage between the two groups. So just looking at the action CVT study, which, you know, has caught the attention of a lot of people in the uh, stroke neurology community is kind of being the, uh, a study that gives us added reassurance about using DOAX in this patient population. Uh, again, there are no kind of obvious safety signals that suggest that DOACs are not an acceptable choice for these uh, patients with CVT. And in fact, the rates of uh, hemorrhage may be lower. 
The limitations of this study, of course, is that this is a retrospective study of cases that were taken from clinical practice where people may have been prescribed one agent or the other uh, for reasons that can't be uh, measured in this study. And um, they were looking at events based on clinical reports. There was no central adjudication, say, of the radiology reports or the bleeding events. Um, we have no means of kind of assessing the adequacy of the warfarin anticoagulation um, in the uh, warfarin group. And the other thing, again, is that this is a limited patient population. Uh, we can't uh, kind of include under this umbrella patients who are pregnant, those who have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, or those who have uh, CVT in the setting of cancer. So there are a number of areas with respect to ongoing uncertainty as to how we do use DOAX and CVT. You know, for example, can we start DOAX right away in patients or do we always require parenteral lead-in? How long do we treat patients for with CVT with anticoagulation? And, um, and how uh, should this be personalized based on whether or not the CVT occurred in the context of transient risk factors versus permanent risk factors? And then also um, with respect to CVT, you know, a lot of patients have good functional outcomes in that they go home and they're functionally independent and can do what they did before. But that doesn't necessarily account for a lot of what the quote invisible disability is that these patients can carry, like chronic headache and fatigue and mood issues. Um, so there are a lot of questions that. Uh, I think we need to integrate into future studies where we look at treatment of CBT and prognosis. So um, one of the studies where uh, we'll get uh, some more answers with respect to patient-centered outcomes is from SECRET. Uh, SECRET is a Canadian trial that we're running. Uh, we have finished recruitment and our last follow-up will be finished in October. Uh, here we're comparing rivaroxaban to uh, warfarin in patients with cerebral venous thrombosis, um, and stay tuned for those results. And then there's also a large prospective international study going on that's looking at the safety of DOAX and CBT, and this is being run internationally by the International uh, CBT Consortium. So just a word with respect to prognosis uh, of CVT. Um, and, uh, you know, I had mentioned this before, but, you know, a lot of the outcomes that we think of when we think of stroke outcomes uh, in other settings is, is whether or not patients will be functionally independent. With CVT, most patients have a good outcome in this regard, about 75 to 85% of patients, depending on which series you look at. But again, a lot of these uh, uh, long lasting issues with respect to headache and mood and cognition and uh, all sorts of issues relevant to quality of life have not been adequately studied in the prospective st uh, setting for CVT patients. And so I'm really looking forward to sharing the results of the secret study with uh, everybody so that um, uh, both practitioners and, and patients can get a better idea of what to expect uh, and not just uh, simply depending on things like, you know, patient uh, uh, support forums for this information. Other things to keep in mind are uh, what the potential rates of recurrence may be, because this helps to inform our decision making around, you know, how long we continue anticoagulation for in which patients. So risk factors for recurrent venous thromboembolism are not different than what we see in other types of thromboembolism in that, you know, male sex, older age, uh, and uh, uh, idiopathic uh, uh, causes of uh, recurrent venous thromboembolism are associated with higher risk of recurrence in addition to kind of known uh, genetic or acquired thrombophilias. Um, with respect to the rates here that are reported of recurrent CVT and recurrent venous thromboembolism, these are actually cumulative rates reported over time um, on a year-to-year -year basis. And again, the kind of longitudinal data is limited. Um, it's about half that on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, Recanalization occurs in the majority of patients. We have earlier prospective neuroimaging studies that show that, you know, as much as 70% of patients uh, who are on anticoagulation may have some degree of recanalization within their first week. Um, and we do know that kind of early recanalization is associated with less parenchymal injury. There's less extension of non-hemorrhagic venous infarct lesions, and there are fewer new lesions that appear. Um, but what the significance 
of recanalization is in terms of prognosis over the longer term is not entirely clear. And this is important because many physicians will use repeat venous imaging over time to decide how long they're going to continue anticoagulation for over the longer term. So um, as uh, we've kind of hinted at throughout the presentation, there are a number of priorities for our research going forward with cerebrovenous thrombosis. I think one big open question is which patients should be receiving endovascular therapy, which as many of you know, we use as a, a routine treatment in patients with severe ischemic arterial stroke. Um, there has been one trial that doesn't show that there is benefit for EVT as a routine treatment for cerebral venous thrombosis, but kind of refining the these questions is very important, and we're still making decisions as to who goes for EVT on a case-by-case -case basis, but in general, it's severely affected patients. One important thing that's come up as we're getting the guidelines together is that there's really no standard way to follow patients from an ophthalmology perspective from center to center. And because patients with CVT have increased intracranial pressure that can be transmitted along the optic nerves and cause permanent visual loss if that's not accounted for or treated, this is a very important thing to be monitored over time. Patients need to be assessed both acutely and over the longer term because papilledema is something that can develop more insidious. Um, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Again, there are lots of questions as to how long we anticoagulate patients for. You know, for patients without a permanent indication for anticoagulation, the duration is recommended between three to 12 months, but there's nuance within that with regards to both physician and patient preference in the clinical setting. And then, of course, in patients who are at higher risk for occurrence beyond that, what do we do in terms of personalized longer-term antithrombotic strategies and what agents and doses do we use? And um, also in terms of outcomes comes for patients uh, with CBT in the trials and studies that we look forward, what are we counting as a good outcome? Um, another thing to keep in mind is that, um, you know, even though CBT has been studied in the international setting, there's still a large bias towards kind of higher income countries. And um, the uh, genetic association studies have been in Caucasian patients. And so we're not getting the complete story in terms of who's at risk and what the prognosis may be. And, um, you know, of course, when you have a disease that's this rare and when you're in need of international collaboration and fuller information, from kind of the, the global state of things, um, you know, this will probably be a disease that will lend itself very nicely to a platform model for future clinical trials. And fortunately, there's a large cooperative international network to support that sort of study going forward. So just back to the cases that uh, Deb had uh, began with, these are all kind of renderings of cases that I've seen uh, in my own personal practice. And so when you're thinking about which patients are suitable for a DOAC, you know, I'm thinking of a, a couple of factors that come into mind. So number one, you know, is this patient suitable for a DOAC at all? Um, number two, if they are suitable for a DOAC, you know, is it the sort of thing that I could consider starting right away and, uh, or should I, you know, do a parenteral lead in? And then the next question is, you know, if they are on a DOAC, how long do I treat them for and, and continue that DOAC for? So, um, when we look at the patient that had her CVT in the context of the postpartum setting, you know, one thing we need to ask ourselves is, um, you know, in that DOAC question is whether or not she's going to breastfeed. So, of course, if she's going to be breastfeeding, she's not going to be the sort of patient that we want to put on a DOAC. So this is a, a personal preference question that you have to have with the patient. And, um, you know, she may finish breastfeeding before um, the course of treatment is over. Um, this particular patient that I'm thinking of, you know, she recanalized very early on, she continued to breastfeed throughout the course of her treatment. And at six months, we decided not to uh, uh, continue with anticoagulation. So she was on a war, she was on warfarin, she was never on a DOAC. Um, the patient that had uh, her uh, CVT in the context of hormone replacement therapy who had uh, a CVT that was not associated with any obvious parenchymal injury and was otherwise doing well, was the sort of patient that I could discharge directly from eMERGE with early follow-up. So this is the sort of patient who actually would be a very good candidate for DOAC due to its convenience and the fact that um, I could give her a prescription and uh, send her out. Um, again, these are the sort of patients you want to follow them up 
early in the outpatient setting, first of all, you want to make sure that they're tolerating the medication well and that they're not having any concerning symptoms that would make you want to uh, kind of, uh, I think, reassess any sort of need for inpatient admission or further monitoring. I like to do an outpatient appointment with a repeat CT head and CT venogram just to make sure that we're on the right track with regards to recanalization. Um, but the strategy has worked well for patients that uh, present uh, with fairly mild presentations in the emergency room who are suitable for discharge. Um, for the next case with the gentleman who has a very extensive CVT, um, this is the sort of patient you're going to want to admit to hospital for monitoring and uh, may be suitable for a parenteral lead-in uh, while you're keeping him in hospital and then considering what to uh, transition him to over the longer period of time. Um, we did end up eventually transitioning to a DOAC, but this was after I was confident that the uh, gentleman was recanalizing in the um, early phase uh, with the help of of repeat parenchymal and venous uh, imaging. And um, because his event was unprovoked uh, in an older male, uh, we've decided that he uh, will be on anticoagulation with a DOAC permanently. And then for the last patient, this is a woman who had extensive parenchymal injury and she required neurosurgery. So this is not obviously the sort of patient that you're going to want to put on a DOAC right away. There's risk of increased intracranial bleeding from the post-surgical injury. And, um, you know, even with respect to per, uh, parenteral uh, anticoagulation, you're going to want to consider what you're going to use after something big like a craniotomy. What we generally do at our center is gradually daily increasing doses of low molecular weight heparin with neuroimaging to follow up in between just to make sure that there are no concerning patterns of bleeding. Um, but eventually, once this patient was stable and able to uh, uh, be transitioned to an oral agent, she was transitioned to a DOAC. Um, her event occurred in the context of a uh, OCP. There were no other risk factors that were identified. And so she ended up on six months of anticoagulation and then uh, she stopped after that. So I guess we'll go on to uh, questions. I will uh, stop sharing my screen here. All right, well, thank you. Um... I tell you what, uh, Thalia Field and Deb Siegel, proof that Canada is conspiring to prove that their people are smarter than everybody else's. Uh, <laughs> excellent. Really enjoyed the presentation. Very, very good talk. And, uh, and a timely topic. We're seeing this more and more. I worked an entire career in anticoagulation therapy and probably couldn't spell CVT, you know, 10 years ago. So um, very, very good. I appreciate it. You know, one of the things I want to take us back to, we often have a um, a large proportion of, uh, of pharmacists on this call. And there's a lot of talk on this call uh, about recanalization and, and, and seemingly as a goal of therapy. I spent a great deal of my time in treating regular DVT-PE, trying to convince people that, you know, clearance of a clot is not the goal of therapy. It shouldn't drive decisions. You don't have guidance suggesting re-imaging for DVT and PE. We worry much more about the risk of recurrence and make decisions about continued therapy based on that. But then we have vascular beds like this one uh, and like the splint mix system where, and then sometimes, in, uh, you know, LV thrombus, which I could go off on a tangent about, where the goal seems to be uh, uh, clearing to the clot or recanalization. So I wonder, could you explain to the pharmacists in the room, uh, recanalization, and explain really what the targets of therapy, where we're sometimes targeting that clot needs to go away and why versus where we're more focused on the risk of recurrence. Sure, so what we know is that um, with cerebral venous thrombosis, even if there is hemorrhage at baseline, you're gonna to wanna to start anticoagulation. Unlike patients that are having like arterial intracranial hemorrhages, the impetus for the bleeding is different in cerebral venous thrombosis. It's due to a backup. Uh, you have a uh, blockage of drainage and then that uh, extravasation of blood is due to increased hydrostatic pressure because those veins can't drain. So you're starting anticoagulation both to reduce the likelihood that the clot will extend, making the pressure worse, and also to facilitate recanalization and treat the overall hypercoagulable state. So the sooner you're getting that drain drainage system open, the sooner you're reducing that impetus for the bleeding. So in almost all cases, you're going to be wanting to start effective anticoagulation as soon as possible, even if there's blood there. And about a third of patients will have some degree of blood on their scans. Interesting. And so um, 
you know, so so in this case, we whereas with DBT and PE, we're we're focusing on decisions about duration. Residual vein. Sounds like that should be 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 considered and and tagging on to that, we do have a lot of questions about duration. What is the acute treatment phase? What is the reevaluation period? What decisions do you make to continue long-term therapy? How would uh, risk factors for recurrence relate to all of that? And, and so Arthur, I'll just, uh, you, you bring up over the acute phase versus the longer term phase. So, you know, we just recently now have uh, prospective neuroimaging information that shows us that early anti, uh, anticoagulation and recanalization definitely are of benefit and that they reduce the burden of brain damage. Kind of what the significance is for recanalization over the longer term is less clear. Um, there have been meta-analyses that look at the significance between recanalization and functional outcomes over the longer term, but it's kind of a mixed bag in terms of quality of studies and when patients are re-imaged. Um, kind of in aggregate, it appears that recanalization in general is associated with better longer term outcomes, but it's really not clear as to whether that's all driven by that early on recanalization during that first week. Um, you know, and, and what we'll find also is that as you re-image patients over the coming months, there are diminishing returns with regards to how much additional recanalization you get between that three-month, six-month, nine-month, 12-month point. And um, so, you know, in patients where you really don't have additional reasons to anticoagulate past a year, most people, even if there is a lack of recanalization going forward, will not continue anticoagulation just because the patient hasn't recanalized. Um, we know over the longer term that people are developing alternative uh, ways to kind of get around that venous drainage or they'd be very sick with a lot of parenchymal injury. So they kind of have these alternative what we call venous collaterals that are taking that over. There is some question, and it's really not clear as to whether or not a lack of recanalization may, similar to DVT, be associated with a risk of recurrence. But overall, the risk of recurrence is so low that generally does not uh, guide our treatment decisions in terms of kind of uh, indefinite anticoagulation in the absence of another good reason to do so. Excellent, excellent. Do you have any thoughts on that? And then I'll let you take it over to the next question. No, it's just thinking that, you know, it's interesting that, um, that, you know, cerebral vein thrombosis, of course, is a type of venous thromboembolism. And the way that, you know, hematologists or thrombosis people usually think about, you know, DVT and PE is that, like Arthur mentioned, you know, we consider the future risk of recurrence um, and that guides our decisions around whether or not to continue. We almost, you know, it's not that the residual clots don't matter. They do because, of course, patients can have, you know, post-thrombotic syndrome and such things. But at the end of the day, we tell patients, you know, the goal of anticoagulation is to help the body dissolve the clot that they have. And then the more, maybe arguably more important goal is to prevent future clots from happening. And that we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what those risks are. Um, and I, I think one of the interesting things is that although the risk of recurrence of CVT, I understand, is, is low, that actually these patients are at risk of other kinds of VTE in the future. And so, you know, there's a decision to be made about continuing anticoagulation, not just to prevent CVT, but to prevent other kinds of VTE, uh, particularly in patients where, you know, you're unable to identify a provoking factor. Um, and those people may be at high enough risk, or if they have a, you know, persistent risk factor, for example. Um, that that might be something important to, to, to keep in mind. So fair to say neurologists, neurosurgeons, and hematologists, thrombosis folks think about these differently. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't want to speak for all the hematologists and neural, I'm not a neurologist, <laughs> so I can't speak for all the neurologists, but just, I, I think, you know, the way that we think about, um, it, uh, you know, it's, it's useful to come together to have these discussions because often you learn about you know, different aspects of treatment that are really important. And perhaps in the thrombosis hematology world, because we're so, um, we're so used to, um, to, almost to not expecting, you know, we expect residual thrombosis in many, many patients, in fact, the majority of patients. So that's not something that we tend to talk about in our clinical practice, but um, it is, you know, a different vascular bed. And I think it's, it's another reason why, you know, you really need to have people who have special expertise and in these different vascular beds, and it's not all the same disease. 
um, you know, CVT is different, portal vein thrombosis is different, you know, DVT is different, um, and they have different complications. Think, yeah, I mean, it's a wonderful opportunity for co-management. I think, you know, as neurologists, we have so much to learn from our, our thrombosis expert colleagues. You know, there are all sorts of considerations that, you know, as neurologists, we're not that focused on and are, you know, have less expertise on, like overall recurrence uh, risk for venous thromboembolism and issues that can sometimes come up with this patient population, like, you know, management of things like heavy menstrual bleeding is not something that we typically deal with as stroke neurologists, given our average patient age overall. Um, so, you know, there, there are a lot of benefits of co-management. Maybe I'll pose um, just there's a, a, a number of questions in the chat um, and actually that were submitted uh, in advance. There's around, you know, if we're talking about uh, treatment using uh, DOAX, you know, the kind of dosing strategies that, that are recommended. You no, know, I know there's some, you know, there are data, but they're limited data. And so, uh, you know, I, one or both of you maybe can, maybe I'll give Thalia an opportunity to answer and then Arthur, you can weigh in too from your side of things. Yeah, so I mean, in terms of kind of the preliminary dosing strategy for use of DOAX, I think if you've done a parenteral uh, lead-in, I think there's a less strong argument for using kind of your acute VTE dosing of uh, a DOAC for a CVT. If you're going to be treating a patient off the bat, I think there's a stronger argument to use that acute dosing, but really like the practice in, reported in the literature is so heterogeneous. In um, in respect CVT, it's easy because, you know, the loading dose of uh, uh, dabigatran is, you know, 150 BID, so it's okay to go ahead. Whereas in secret, we actually started with the 20 milligram uh, dose, which was uh, Bayer's preference, uh, without kind of that higher dose leading in. I find in general, when we're using it outside of the uh, trial context, uh, we tend to use the acute VTE dose if there's no parenteral lead in. But, but again, you know, I, I don't know what the right answer is. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, and especially I think that when we see bleeding, anything on a head scan that shows bleeding, folks get uh, get squirrely, um, and there will be this impetus to maybe ease into, ease into anticoagulation therapy, and I know Deb and I, prior to going live, we're talking about, you know, do you bolus heparin, do you not bolus heparin, and the preference seems to be uh, treat quickly, because we're going to help reduce the risk of bleeding, much like, again, portal vein thrombosis. If you treat portal vein thrombosis in a scary looking cirrhotic patient, uh, you're going to reduce the risk of variceal bleeding, bleeding, so it may be counterintuitive. So to that end, I would I would argue that if the goal is early recanalization, um, then a more aggressive, not less oppress, uh, aggressive approach should be favored. I do agree with you with the injectables. However, if these patients are, you know, admitted briefly and they, and they haven't received, you know, you know, five, seven days of injectable uh, before going to a, a, a you know, a, a DOAC, specifically one with a lead-in period, I would probably be tempted to favor the higher dose if, the, if we're truly not worried about, um, you know, worsening bleeding complications. Yeah, we, we've struggled with this, in fact, and we, you know, in, in when we were working on, has we been working on the CDT guidelines to understand, you know, particularly in the acute setting, um, if one is going to give uh, an IV unfractionated heparin, and again, there's a, you know, there may be scenarios where it's um, desired, um, you know, there was another question in the chat around the intensity of that initial treatment, um, you know, in my mind, the, you know, you would have to have a really good rationale for not providing, you know, therapeutic intensity treatment. Um, if you both, you know, part of doing that with IV infection heparin is to give a bolus um, and there are nomograms to use, which is appropriate. Um, sometimes in, even in our ICU setting, people are concerned about using a bolus and perhaps that's too much anticoagulation. And once I just want to, you know, that, that that is not, they're not thrombolytic drugs, right? This is a, you know, it's because heparin has a short half-life, which I'm sure all the pharmacists on this call are more familiar with than me, but just to say that it, you know, it's 36 hours, you know, often um, to become therapeutic. So your, your goal of early therapeutic anticoagulation is like impaired by uh, just starting an infusion without a bolus. And so it's just important to keep in mind, like what are the risks, what are the harms and benefits of that approach? Um, when you're in factoring that into your decision-making there, again, there may be scenarios like that severe bleeding complication patient, somebody who requires, you know, urgent surgery or some sort of thing. But um, just to keep in mind that, you know, you, you may actually be causing harm by delaying the onset of therapeutic anticoagulation and that persisting like increased venous pressure that's causing bleeding. Um, so it's just, I, I want to make that point. 
Excellent. You know, we have a we have a question that I think uh, is also timely, and especially because we have neur neurology and we have heme here. Um, the question is, what is the approach to thrombophilia testing among patients with estrogen associated CVT? But I would extend that to to really any to especially unprovoked CVT or in CVT where we're, we're unable to determine a provoking factor. Um, you know, in the in the thrombosis world, we tend to think of uh, um, you know, thrombosis in goofy places, uh, a, a, a reason to consider thrombophilia testing, but we also know that thrombophilia testing also doesn't change our, our treatment strategy. So I'd be curious to hear the opinions on thrombophilia testing for um, CBT, both provoked by, say, estrogen or unprovoked. Do you want me to go with, I'll, you want me to take a first stab at that one? So very sure. controversial, <laughs> you know, um, and I think A condition that primarily affects young people. So this actually comes up. Important to keep in mind that you know there's different kinds of thrombophilias. There's a genetic and then a thrombophilia scenario. You'd put things like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which I understand is actually rarely associated with CVT, but can be. Um, and so you know I think many of us, in particularly in the absence of another you know reason or risk factor that we could identify. Um, would think about thrombophilia testing. The caveat being, of course, is that, you know, it's important to understand how and whether, whether and how that would change your management. So if you're going to continue anticoagulation long-term in a patient, um, then it may not, it may not matter. Um, you're obviously going to assess, you know, for things like a strong family history and the people who have, you know, rare, you know, inherited thrombophilias like protein CS or thrombodeficiency, there's often almost always a really strong family history of thrombosis. Um, and so that's something that's important to keep in mind. Um, but that's actually not very when are you going to do it? So it's it's like whether, how, and then when. Um, up front, and we find that often people are often sending these things up front. And you know, patient has a diagnosis and they're in the ICU or something. When you send up all these tests, so you know many thrombophilia tests and inherit tests for inherited thrombophilia are actually not appropriate to do in the setting of acute thrombosis because the coagulation factors are consumed, and also in the setting of anticoagulation because some of the tests, of course, are clot-based assays. So if you if you test them all in anticoagulation, you get erroneous results or potentially false positive results. So for many of the inherited thrombophilias, you know you have time to wait and see and think about whether or not and consider and discuss with your patient and their family about whether or not you want to test. Um, the test that I think makes some sense early on is to test for antiphospholipid antibodies. And I'll just say that with a caveat, you know, we know that there is a higher prevalence of antiphospholipid antibodies among acutely unwell hospitalized patients. We don't always know uh, what the implications of that are, but if a person fulfills the criteria for APS um, because they have a clot and they have two antibodies positive on two separate occasions, 12 weeks apart, um, then, then, you know, in, in fact, you may want to consider uh, warfarin as your preferred treatment. So it does have a treatment implication. And although I'm rambling a bit, I think that um, that's, that's a little bit how I would approach it. So you can't, unless, so it's just also important to keep in mind, you can test for anti-cardiolipin and anti-beta-2 uh, glycoprotein-1 antibodies, right? That's a serology test on anticoagulation. You cannot test for a lupus anticoagulant while someone is on uh, anticoagulation. So important. If you're going to, if you're thinking a person has anti APS, you know it's the right setting. They've got an autoimmune disorder. Um, maybe they have mild thrombocytopenia. They have a rash. There's something else that's triggering you to think about APS. You know, send your lupus anticoagulant before you start anticoagulation, or don't send it. Sally, do you have any thoughts on that? Where how neurology may think think about this? Was that uh, a line other than called called Deb Siegel? Uh, is, is <laughs> any other any other <laughs> any other? Deb Siegel thinks too much. <laughs> no, <laughs> no I think you know Deb. Wonderful. It's kind of funny that you said rambling because I think the very fact that we have you know uh, an expert sitting here talking about all of this, if this, then that, what it really says is. Um, not everybody should be doing these. And in fact, those who are probably should be calling somebody like a Deb Siegel in the world. So at any rate, go ahead, Sally. 
No, and, and I agree with you completely. You know, I think some of these difficult questions, are the perfect opportunity to co-manage with our thrombosis colleagues. And, you know, these are questions that we're trying to answer together as we uh, create the CBT guidelines. And, and I completely agree. You know, we're learning that, you know, antiphospholipid antibodies is going to change your, your treatment strategy kind of earlier on. And that's an important answer to have although it's it's rarely ends up being a consideration in this patient population, fortunately. Excellent. You know, we have one one question, we have time for one last question and it's gonna be brief because we've already addressed this. One of the primary questions we've seen, and I think it's pertinent is, when do you start anticoagulation therapy after a CVT with a bleed? And I think we've basically said, um, you know, we need to start therapy earlier, be more afraid of not adequately treating the, the um, uh, the clot versus worried about extension of the bleed. Did I get that right? That's that's exactly it. Yeah, in almost all patients, you're going to want to start effective anticoagulation as soon as possible. Um, and if there is bleeding that's making people nervous, you know, your neurology colleagues will be able to do repeat neuroimaging just to make sure that there are no signals that suggest that you're not on the right track. Awesome. We'll, we'll kick it back over to Liv Goldstein. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm Liz Goldstein, Executive Director of the AC Forum, and I am so grateful for the speakers today. What a phenomenal talk. And to have the world experts is really an honor and great. Thank you for sharing. So Deb Siegel, Thalia Field, Arthur Allen, thank you so much. And Thalia, I loved your comment about crow management. To have hematology, neurology, and pharmacy on here is just exactly what AC Forum is all about. So thank you all so much. Just a few administrative updates. So Deb mentioned um, this is accredited for pharmacists, physicians, and nurses, and the link is in the chat and here online. This program has been recorded and will be posted on the AC Forum website next week along with these slides so you can access this link. Um, we have a whole bunch of webinars coming up. So hot off the presses, new perioperative guidelines, and we, as soon as we saw it, got the authors on to agree to do a webinar, I think in two weeks or so, Feb September 9th. So please join us for that. September is also PAD Awareness Month. So we are gonna do a discussion on health disparities in PAD what the anticoagulation provider needs to know because not everyone, not all of anticoagulation providers are up on PAD, but they should be. Um, we are very excited that the AC Forum, it will be launching a playbook, an implementation playbook on advancing anticoagulation stewardship. And we'll more to come in a minute on that. And then also AC Forum published updated COVID guidance. So we will be walking you through our updated guidance at the end of October. So please join us for all four of these webinars. We have a boot camp coming up October 7th and 8th. These are always a huge great feedback, huge success. Please um, check out the AC Forum website and register. register Registration's open now. Um, and save the date for our national conference, April 1 through 3 in San Francisco. That registration will be opening soon. Um, two big announcements. One is AC Forum has new grant funding for a brand new ASHP accredited PGY2 pharmacy residency in thrombosis and hemostasis management, brand new. This is very rare that ASHP starts a new residency and they did it in this field. So we will be offering awards of up to 120,000 for two year period. At least we'll be offering this to at least four institutions in the 2022 cycle. Applications should open later today, and it's a short turnaround, so please visit um, our website for more information. And as I mentioned, um, a new playbook was written by NQF, National Quality Forum, in partnership with us and funding from the FDA. This will be available for free download um, either later this week or next week, so please check it out. It's really very practical guidance on how to implement an anticoagulation stewardship program at your site, no matter what level you are, small community hospital or large academic center, it will give you tools and resources. And lastly, thank you to all of our sponsors who helped make this webinar program happen. So thank you all and have a great day.